I'm, I'm deeply pleased to welcome you all and thank our speakers who uh, took some of their valuable time to be here with us in this very important session on government research and industry for sustainable development. The session will shed light on the very important dimensions of sustainable development as anchored by the trio of science, technology, and innovation that can be effective through government's commitment to providing physical and soft infrastructure with enabling ecosystem through deploying appropriate policies that incentivize private sector to invest in product development. I'm sure that the session will provide a platform for fruitful and vibrant discussions. The first speaker and, will, and the will-be moderator of the session is Dr. Fuad Murad. Dr. Fuad Murad is experienced industrial product developer, academic researcher, and thought leader. He is an expert in technology and innovation in the Arab world. His current role as the Frontier Technology Manager at the United Nations ESQA keeps him at the forefront of several industry trends. As the longest tenured juror on the panel, Professor Murad brings a gravitas and know-how to stars of science. He has been guiding the region's brightest minds during every step of their innovation journey. Professor Murad received his PhD and MSc degrees in electrical engineering from Purdue University, USA. He is an author and contributor to a wide variety of academic papers and journals. Through his work at the UN, he leads a team of working and working with government agencies to effectively deploy policies that enable innovation throughout region. Dr. Murad will uh, introduce a talk about the Arab country scientific research existing capacity and impact. Dr. Fuad, please. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah, for the introduction. I'm sorry for the long bio. It took time. I'm still waiting for other colleagues on the panel. I'm honored to uh, moderate the session among colleagues and experts uh, that I can learn from. Uh, when, when I see Dr. Badran is a participant in the meeting and uh, Dr. Zalbi, Munif Zalbi, and other colleagues who uh, through the years, I learned a lot from them and read a lot about their work about the region and the specific topic exactly. Uh, my colleagues on the panel, I will introduce when, uh, when, when I will give them the airways. And uh, the topic, as you know, is not new. And for decades, 30, 40, 50 years, the whole world is working on connecting university to industry, on uh, the triangle between university, industry, and government, and then the added civic society uh, in the rectangular shape. But what is, what is new, and I hope we could shed some light and have, have a relevant conversation to today's topic is the technology, is the context we live in. And I wanna thank the Islamic World Academy of Sciences, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the Industrial Research and Development Fund and the Higher Council for Scientific Research in Jordan for organizing this very timely topic because innovation and research must go hand in hand, especially in our developing countries that the capacity to catch up is residing in the University wow. and Research Center. And that capacity has to have ways out. It's looking for gates, it's looking for policies. And that's why I am very happy to facilitate the session and uh, 
and share with you some relevant facts before I give the airways to my colleagues who will give us regional and international relevant facts on the topic. I wanna thank Qatar Foundation and Qatar Science and Technology Park for giving opportunities for Arab youth and impacting culture and our communities to show the way, how do you transform ideas into products or what has been called the Death Valley. And again, by launching Stars of Science 14 years ago, a TV program, a media program, just because we're appreciating the role of culture that is critical in guiding our youth and guiding our policies and in applying our knowledge. So culture is critical and cannot be ignored. It is at the core of development. And that's why TV and digital platforms have been harnessed through stars of science to affect that exactly. And in the Arab world, there is significant capacity. Some people talk about the critical mass, and I'm not going to go. There are physicists with us on the panel that I'm worried about mentioning the word critical mass. However, in the Arab world, we know that there is relevant capacity. Scientific publications added almost to like 272,000 yearly. This is an average. We took an average of 2018. And I know there are references and experts on this, uh, and, and this meeting who could correct the number. However, we're getting an idea. We don't want to judge the exact number, but there is relevant size of research publications from the Arab world distributed per country. There is another fact on spending. And again, this doesn't cover all the spending of JIRD, which is global expenditure on R&D. From public sector, mainly in the Arab world, it's really public funding of research. That is what we're talking about. Unlike developed countries where 70, 80% of what's been spent on R&D comes from the private sector, private sector is not playing any role or very insignificant small role when it comes to R&D in the Arab world. So you find and this is not the sum of all the Arab countries. This is for the countries we found data. Almost $19 billion yearly spent on research. And on purpose, I said research because there is a problem with the D and the R&D. So we're spending a lot on research. And there is a question mark on how much is spent on the development part. The researchers, FTEs, Again, this is not all the Arab world. For example, Saudi Arabia is a major player, and we couldn't get a number for that country. However, this is the full-time equivalent in 2018 for most of the Arab countries, which is, again, a significant labor force community that has a huge capacity. If we look at the Global Innovation Index, this is 2021, but it won't be that much different in 22 or 2020 or 2015. And the last 15 years, the top 10 innovators of the world, we know starting from Switzerland, UK, USA, and so on. But the Arab countries, despite all their efforts, this is our ranking. And maybe a country goes a couple you know, digits up and down in the ranking. We're doing a lot of efforts, but the rest of the world is doing more efforts, maybe more efficient effort, more effective effort. This ranking is not changing, unfortunately. So with all that capacity, I just want to shed some light on success story that aimed only to harness TV to affect the culture and aspiring scientific and technological entrepreneurship among the Arab youth. And the fact that it ran for 14 years, this is also something to stop at in the Arab world where we launch a program and we don't only celebrate cutting the ribbon and taking pictures and videos of the opening and forget about it two years later. This is 14 years of sustained commitment 
to Arab innovation and youth and supporting that culture for Arab youth. Again, it doesn't happen in one program. And I threw this map here to show the partnerships of Stars of Science um, with universities, with companies, private sector, government agencies, and so on. Funding, dedicated uh, application in sports and hospitalization and medicine and industry construction. So when you talk about innovation, this is not a one person show. This is a teamwork, multidisciplinary. And you see the map, it's quite extensive and rich. I took a couple case studies only. And I said, these cases transformed researchers to innovators. I didn't say it's transforming research to innovation because what's more important than the invention is the inventor. What's more important than the research publication is the researcher because ecosystem change, technology and challenges change, but resources, human resources are the most sustained and most important in the case studies. So researchers to innovators. And I took three cases, I'll stop there. The first one is a Yemeni professor of electrical engineering right now in Moscow, in Russia. And after his publication, he transformed his publication into a prototype. And that was in 2021, in the middle of the pandemic. Another, I'm not gonna dwell on the topic because obviously we're looking at the process rather than the project. Another successful case is a professor in Germany, Dr. Walid Al-Banna, he's from Palestine. And after several publications, he came to Stars of Science so that we help him transform his publication, a research output, into an impactful outcome. And this is a picture of the prototype he ended up with. The last one is PhD computer science from the USA. He's, he's from uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but he was a PhD student in Carnegie Mellon, Pennsylvania. And again, Star of Science helped him transform his publication into a relevant product. I have, I, I, I'm proud to say from season seven, now we're in season 14. So seven years later, Dr. Hassan Al-Balawi has products on the market in many, many countries. He has raised tens of millions of dollars. I'm not gonna say the exact numbers. I, I will leave it up to him to share. So again, I selected these cases to show a research publication transformation to a product rather than you know grassroots innovation. I'm gonna stop right here because I am very happy to introduce our next panelist who will shed light from her world of intellectual property. And I know the topic of intellectual property has been discussed several times, especially in universities and research centers. In the era of open science, in the era of open data, open knowledge, open innovation, we look at added value, we look at surviving the avalanche that is happening in the frontier technologies and the inline education for universities. And Bahia Aliafi will guide us through a promising, a promising a presentation that will take 15 to 20 minutes to show us hope, how to open the gates of knowledge in the universities in the MENA region towards supporting our society, economy, and priorities. Bahia, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Mjad. I really appreciate it. And I hope I'll live up to your expectations. I'm gonna try to. I'm just gonna, um, one second. Okay. 
We can see the presentation, Bahia. Awesome. So. Great. So innovation is, um, Francis Gurry, who is the head of WIPO, said innovation is the most important for economic growth, development, and the creation of better jobs and engines. Historically, innovation was a nice to have. It was nice to travel. Um, then it became a want to have. Nespresso is something that I would like to get it and so on. Nowadays, our economy, with our economies, it's a must have. Otherwise we will become obsolete. We all know what happened to Nokia. But Nokia still has patents and has commercialized patents. So how can we remain competitive and relevant in the age of innovation? So first, let's look at what the barriers to innovation are in the MENA. The first is investment in R&D and innovation. And as Dr. Imrad accurately pointed out that there is no lack of investment, we are investing. However, are we investing in the right places? So low private sector investment in innovation and there's a disconnected and unfocused public sector investment in innovation. As for our economic models, our business models currently, in terms of corporations, are built on relationships. We have bigger companies in the market, family businesses, and so on, that have existed in the market based on their relationships. Do they really need to innovate within our MENA region? There is a lack of adequate source of funding for SMEs within this region to compete with these bigger uh, family businesses. And businesses locally are looking more at short-term price comparisons than getting a long-term monopoly because it's more about survival. So nowadays within our region, a lot of the source of innovation does not necessarily come from corporations. It comes from research institutions and universities. So this is our main source of innovation. But there's a lack. There's a lot of research and innovation happening at universities and R&D centers, but this is not making its way to the market. Why? Internationally, so many products that we know of, like Gatorade, come from universities. Why don't we have these within the MENA region? Solar power, CAT scans, ultrasound, IVF, they all stem from universities. Even from football um, teams at universities, like the University of Florida and Gatorade. But somehow it's not coming to market. Let's start with the story of sliced bread. Sliced bread was invented in 1910. No one heard about it. No one knew about it. The bread looked sloppy. It was, uh, it was not marketable. It, it was convenient because you don't have to actually spend time cutting the bread, but it never really came to market until 1928. Why? Because it was properly marketed because it was properly presented to consumers, because there was a need after the war for sliced bread and rationing. So innovations, no matter how novel and extraordinary, they can still fall short of our societal needs. It's the application of a simple innovation and how the market perceives it that's important. It's not just about coming up with research. It's about developing the research and making sure it's usable in the market. And this example is very simple. It's about sliced bread. What if we're talking about an actual drug or something that's more complex than sliced bread? So let's look at the pillars of the knowledge system. We have knowledge producers, knowledge intermediaries, knowledge enablers, and knowledge users. Knowledge producers, these are all, I purposely siloed them because that's how they're thought of now. Whereas we can't think of them that way. We have to think of the interdependence between the university, the producer, the intermediary and the user. We have to have an approach for how to create and invest in R&D that actually makes it to the market that's aligned with 
the policymakers vision. So the first thing that I, we're advising is we need to have a strategic approach to research and development. We do come up with ideas, but how are these ideas going to launch in the market? And reassessing this process is very important because just coming up with the idea because we have the right professors, because we have the right labs, because we have the right tools is not enough. This brings me back to, okay, we have the idea, we have the research, but you know what? As a university, I need more funds. For me to get more funds, I need to publish. For me to publish, I need peer review. So I'm going to avoid going down the IP route and just go down the path and just go down the publication route. Why? Because as a university, as a siloed educational institution, it, the short run benefit is get is bigger in terms of publication. However, the long term societal benefit is probably better when all of these interact publication patents and copyrights. So we need to understand the connectivity and the dependence between the different players in the market, as Dr. Murad said. Uh, we do not exist alone. Well, there are a lot of linkages. It's not only the researcher, it's not only the university, it's not only the government, and it's not only public institutions. We have to make sure there's a collaboration that's, that's multi-dimensional. And we have to foster a, an environment of debate. Within our culture, debate is um, might be perceived positively in some, in some in some MENA countries and other MENA countries, it's not. But debate actually gets us to the premium. What are we getting at? And when we're debating, we're fighting for each of our incentives or each of our objectives, but we're concluding to get to, a, to an aligned objective that's good for the society as a whole. So first we have to acknowledge that there's connectivity and dependence between different players in the market. Second, we need to, instead of creating innovation or creating research and sending it to market, we need to balance between the demand, the demand pull and the supply push of R&D. We also have to, as Dr. Imrad said, and it's by no means um, an undermining uh, goal, Actually, the stars of science is very important and it's critical to create this, um, this aura of the importance of science. Uh, sharing success stories of entrepreneurs is, is critical in Silicon Valley. It's critical to make sure that other people are interested in entrepreneurship, that other people are interested in innovation. So sharing success stories helps creating the demand for R&D. Also, in order to generate more demand, we need to build the capacity of private and public institutions on the importance of data. Um, there was a, I'm not sure if any one of you watched, there was a, this video of uh, a baseball coach who used data uh, and statistic, statistical information to choose the different players within their team. He chose the worst players in each individual team, but combined because of data, he was able, Brad Pitt was able to create a winning team. So understanding the importance of data and the importance of the r and the research that's happening at universities will create a demand pull to make sure that the cycle of innovation does not stop at we publish the, we publish the piece. So aligning the incentives and objectives is very important. So commercialized, published, or patent, which one is it? And it doesn't have to be one or the other. If we have a strategy in place, if we have a vision in place, if we have something that uh, works with all of us because of our internal debates, then what we can do is we can balance our objectives and where we want to reach. It's important when looking at IP to look at different types of IP. A patent uh, is 
a patent is something that allows you to monopolize the market versus a copyright is something that allows you to talk about or market your innovation. All, both of these are types of IP and both of these are important, but how they're protected and how they allow a business to benefit from it is different. So making sure we understand the local laws of IP and the local um, strategies and vision and balancing our economic needs with our social needs and our environmental and sustainability needs is very important to make sure that we have R&D efficiency and we have innovation efficiency. In order to measure the impact of investments in innovation, we have to know what our return on investment is, what our return on investment in innovation is. And there's, uh, this is not being done as, as it should be. Because when we look at it, we need to look at we need to look at it from a systems approach. So, what are the different elements that we need to look at? It has to be the micro view. It can't be the micro view. It can't be just what the university needs, or just what the government needs, or just what the funder needs. And on top of all of this, we need to have a layer of governance that ensures that there's transparency in decision-making and the allocation of funds. Why is this fund being provided and why is this research being done? What is our end goal? We need to have that and we need to link it to our national strategies, our university missions and visions. A healthy innovation system needs a lot of players and underlying all of it is governance, transparency, and an understanding of IP laws. The BINA region has been improving and in a siloed way. There has been Vision 2030, Vision 2050, and so on across the GCC and North Africa region, which is a great start. Universities are top notch. There's so much research that's going on. How can we align these to make sure that we reach our societal vision while making sure that our researchers have the ability to go into their own ventures, innovation ventures. Um, in terms of IP laws, the laws in the region have been improving so much. And it's not about the law, it's about understanding the relationship between these laws, how IP laws can actually help universities and help the, the entrepreneurs and help corporations in making sure that we build thriving economies and ambitious nations that, are, that will remain and not become obsolete like Nokia. Uh, I hope this was helpful and uh, Dr. Mdad, back to you. Thank you so much, Bahia. Uh, as we're calling for more balanced peer review and work and research in the universities, I want to thank the organizers for having balanced panel where we have somebody like Bahia from the private sector uh, discussing the topic with the universities and research centers and funding of research. This is very important. Uh, without uh, further uh, comments, and there are a lot, and I'm sure our, our, our participants will have their time to comment and ask questions to Bahia later, I want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lutfi Belkhair. I can speak about Lutfi like an international expert. He's a physicist, inventor, and entrepreneur. Professor at Qatar University, while originally from Algeria, practiced a lot of his career in Canada, in McMaster University. He founded and was the CEO of one of the most successful companies in 2001, as acknowledged by the prestigious, prestigious Best of What's New Award by the popular Science Magazine in 2003. 
I am very honored to ask Dr. Belkhair to give us a very relevant case from Qatar universities where they combined a research in their planning at the university level and the same level with innovation. So now we have teaching service, research and innovation. And it's a very interesting model that uh, Dr. Lutfi will discuss. And you have 15 to 20 minutes, uh, Lutfi, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Borad. Um, thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be uh, among uh, all these uh, distinguished folks. And thank you for having me present um, uh, what we believe is a fairly novel approach to uh, nurturing innovation in an in academic environment. Uh, are you all able to see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So uh, what I'm going to be presenting to you is still work in progress, so to speak. Uh, it's, uh, we only really designed this plan in November. We started implementation in January or more or less in February. And uh, so what I'm going to be sharing with you are the current results we got. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, I want to share with you our method. Uh, as a scientist, um, although it's only one of my facets, uh, I, I believe that the most important uh, scientific achievement was the scientific method itself. Uh, this is why when I went to MIT physics department, I was very pleased to see the bust of Hassan Nul Haytham, the father of the scientific method as one of the five most influential physicists in the history of mankind. Uh, and again, uh, I, I guess it's fair to say that it's, it's the scientific method that led to the incredible fast and uh, widespread development of scientific achievements across the whole world. So uh, from that perspective, as a physicist, I come from a very strong, uh, I would say, fundamentalistic approach to uh, doing things, especially things as complex as innovation entrepreneurship. But the other side of the coin is that I come to it also from a very practical perspective as a practitioner who started his own uh, high-tech company and led it for about 10 or 11 years. And, uh, and again, physics teaches us that theory without practice is, uh, or practice without theory is blind, uh, but theory without practice is kind of also futile and, uh, and doesn't lead uh, very far. So without further ado, I'd like to essentially share with you what the vision for transformation of Qatar University. <clears throat> Very quickly, Qatar University started as actually an undergraduate college in 2002, uh, as the old university model focused exclusively almost on education. And then um, and from 2000 to 2016, it went through a very major transformation. Uh, become the classical university model with uh, some very uh, um, breakthrough research. Uh, and that essentially allowed uh, Qatar University to appear in the top 150 universities in the world and ranking as number two uh, in the Arab world. And from 2016 onward, uh, Qatar University has essentially embarked in this new transformative university model, uh, which essentially brings the importance of socioeconomic impact to par with the other two pillars, which are essentially teaching and research. Uh, service being essentially uh, serving those three pillars. And this is what we believe uh, is going to lead hopefully to the design of the future Arab national university as, a, as a, an inspiring model, at least this is what we hope. Uh, before before I, uh, I talk about our efforts in innovation, I think that's a great segue to Ms. Bahia Al-Yafi uh, in terms of uh, invention versus innovation. And here where I kind of break the mold from traditional definitions or, uh, or understanding of what innovation is about. And so this, I'm just going to uh, share with you very quickly some, some very uh, 
limited data, um, there's a lot more to be uh, shared with this. But here's I'm showing essentially the ranking of US companies who are, you could say, the most inventive measured by the number of patents they received in 2018. And whenever I show this kind of data to the audience, even though I've been showing this since 2013, uh, when I was in McMaster Canada, there is, there is kind of a silent gasp from the audience uh, when they see IBM, 9,000, over 9,000 patents a year, which probably is more patents than a lot of the Arab countries have in one single year, followed by Samsung and then Canon, uh, GE, Intel, and then you don't see Apple until number nine position with only 2,147. In fact, this is even more dramatic if you go back to 2010, where IBM has 6,000 patents and Apple has less than 500 patents in 2010, even though Apple was kind of the number one most valuable company uh, back then in 2010. And you say, okay, well, it looks like, um, IBM is really up there, but I haven't heard of IBM much in terms of innovation. So there is a separate innovation ranking and there things actually start becoming even more strange uh, is that Apple, uh, as would have been expected, is number one. And Apple has been number one in this innovation ranking since 2010. Then you see Amazon, you see Alphabet, but guess what? IBM does not show up at all in that top 10 innovation ranking. Uh, so this starts calling to question, uh, the, what is the difference between invention and innovation? And is there in fact at all a correlation between invention and innovation? And again, I have the data and, the, and the, those studies show that there is actually zero correlation between invention and innovation. Uh, however, uh, you may ask, okay, so which one is more important? Uh, and I asked this question to my students, uh, engineering and so on. And I uh, said, if you were to choose between being an inventor and innovator, which one would you choose? And most of the time, more than half of the class wants to be an inventor. And then I ask, okay, what is the difference between invention and innovation? And I get the answers all over the map. And I get similar answers when I ask scientists and engineers and executives. Until I go through this data, and, uh, and then uh, the interesting part is what matters? Is it invention or innovation in terms of what matters to the market, in terms of what the market actually values? And we can measure that uh, through market capitalization, which is the value of the stock of those markets. And what you see, uh, and let's take just this, is, this example as of uh, 2021, IBM market capitalization, was about $115 billion, whereas Apple was $2.7 trillion, or more than 20 times the market cap of IBM. Again, uh, this is one data point, but again, there is a much more extensive study that shows essentially that market capitalization is not correlated at all with either the number of patents or the, even the amount of R&D spent per year but is very strongly correlated with the innovation ranking of those companies. So the message here is market cap, uh, or I would say market impact, uh, values innovation much more than invention, uh, which really begs the question, how different are they? And again, just for the interest of time, uh, this analysis has a lot more data uh, uh, behind it. But the basic difference that we essentially conclude is that the two are very, very different. That an invention essentially is the use of technology and science to solve a technical problem. And that solving of technical problem essentially makes it a purely technical achievement. Whereas innovation is the use of science and technology to solve a social problem. And that makes it a social achievement. Solving a tech social problem has usually an impact that translates into economic returns as well. Whereas solving a purely technical achievement may or may not have any impact in society or create economic returns. And let's face it, 
more than 99% of patents out there had zero social or economic impact. In fact, most of them have never seen the day as a working or successful product. This essentially leads to a very important uh, ripple effects. And, uh, and it essentially leads to questioning our definition of innovation. So the definition that we use as a working definition uh, here is that it's the creation of value using novel thinking. Uh, and that novel thinking could be technologies and science. And usually it is because technology and science are huge enablers in terms of scalability, in terms of competitive advantage, but it does not have to be. Uh, you take the examples of Amazon or Facebook or even Tesla uh, or Twitter. Those have, or, or Starbucks for that matter, those have great innovators that have had huge social and economic impact but pretty much have invented nothing. The AC uh, electric motor that Tesla uses was invented and patented by Nikola Tesla in 1882 and has been in the public domain uh, for, uh, for anyone to use, but has not. Uh, the lithium ion battery that Tesla uses is simply the hooking up of 15,000 cell phone batteries together to make the most efficient electric battery in the world when in fact GM and uh, uh, Toyota and other car companies have invested billions of dollars to make a full scale lithium ion battery that they could never get to work uh, with the same efficiency and the same reliability and manufacturability. And so one essentially is led to, to, to consider that Tesla is far more innovative than all those car companies together. Uh, despite the fact that they have generated a lot of patents through their search for a full-scale lithium-ion battery, whereas Tesla has generated very little. This also has a huge impact on how we manage or nurture innovation in an academic setting. And here's where I'm going to break the mold uh, for, or rank with, uh, with Ms. Bahia Aliafi, is that encouraging innovation through uh, more publications and through IP and patent development and so on is actually not the right direction in our opinion. And it's changing the mindset of those faculties and the researchers and, and, and training them and getting them to agree what innovation is about to actually drive them to be driven not by publications and number of patents and promotion, but to be driven really by making the socioeconomic impact through their research, which in fact, if you change that mindset and you're able to get that motivation and that drive is going to change the kind of research they're going to be gravi gravitating to and the kind of research they're going to, uh, to, to, to seek to develop. And uh, I'll show you later some of the testimonials we got, but one of the testimonials I got was, uh, from two very senior researchers and professors here at Qatar University. One of them was, is actually the director of research for the whole health, healthcare sector at Qatar University. And he came to me after the first presentation saying, Lotfi, I came for to this training initially to invent. Now, after what I heard from you, I don't want to invent, I want to innovate. And he picked actually a very different project from the one he initially had. The other one, I had it at the end of the training from another very well professor with a lot of citations and publications. And he came to me and said, Dr. Lotfi, um, I've always thought that making money out of my research and, uh, and inventions was a bad thing. I never wanted to actually make money out of my research. And, uh, but now after this, I realized that for my research, to have a social impact, the only way to do it is through the commercialization route. That otherwise I would never be able to see the fruit of my research. That to me was the greatest testimony I could hear because there was a mindset change. Uh, and like both uh, Professor Murad and uh, Ms. Aliafi, I think uh, mentioned, really the, 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 the main goal that we're trying to have here is to create that human capital 
and that kind of mindset among the human capital to actually be driven by commercialization, be driven by entrepreneurship and innovation as the and only path for, uh, for social impact, for diversification of the economy, for creation of jobs, for, civil, for to really take on the civilizational challenge that we have in front of us. There is no other path, not the path of publications, not the path of patents, it's the path of innovation in the sense of creation of value using novel thinking. And so very quickly here, I know uh, Professor Morad, I'm running probably out of time here, but let me just take you quickly through Qatar University vision, which is to be a region recognized for distinctive excellence in education and research and a catalyst for sustainable economic development in Qatar. And the seed office was developed essentially as this execution arm to bring and build this pillar, this third pillar, and to that will essentially establish a very comprehensive ecosystem for innovation and economic development. So the office was uh, created in October 2021, and essentially the mission is this catalyst for innovation, knowledge-based, sustainable economic in all of Qatar, not just Qatar University itself. So our approach is a system approach centered on human capital development, which is now supported with practice-oriented training, funding, prototyping resources, incubation infrastructure, governance, mentorship, and external ecosystem partners like uh, Stars of Science, QSTP, QDB, and other key stakeholders without whom this cannot be done. This is really, it takes, uh, it takes all of these players to be able to develop this human capital that we're seeking to develop. And so, uh, and as I mentioned, there is, there is a method to this madness, if you wish. Uh, and, that, and that method is essentially is, is a comprehensive training uh, through all the various stages of development. And we kind of uh, do the analogy of, as a startup, as an infant. You need to take them through the gestation and the inception, the gestation phase, then through the childhood phase, through then the teenage until they actually are able to, uh, to walk on their own feet as, as an entrepreneur, as a successful startup. And each stages of development, which we call the pre-incubation, incubation one and two and acceleration, has its own stage specific training and learning and mentorship and funding as well. Because it's very easy to take a group of entrepreneurs through one stage, have a demo day, distribute some prizes and say, okay, now go and conquer the world. They're not ready to conquer the world. They need more handholding, more love, more nurturing, more training until they get to the level. You, you don't ask a, a four year old child to say, okay, give me your business plan, how much you're going to earn, how much you're going to bring me, otherwise I'm gonna kill you and bring another baby that actually might be more successful. Two minutes, very good. So that's what we talk about this uh, comprehensive innovation framework. I'm going to go very quickly through it. So this is essentially going beyond the business model canvas that many of you are familiar. And this innovation framework is what allows us to develop, identify, manage, and nurture innovation. So it will take me probably a little more than two minutes, but here's I'm just essentially talking about the uh, stages of development, which is an iterative process using the same framework. This is stage one, where we take them essentially to the development of the market, the solution, the business model, in a way that's fully interconnected and interdependent. And then, as I said, each stage has its own training and development until they get to the stage three, where essentially they are uh, fully validated the startup with a product that's already in the marketplace with a clear uh, market potential. And that's when they move to the acceleration phase. So these are just additional, uh, let me just play a quick, do I, do I have time for a quick video, uh, Professor Murad? Sorry. No, no, we don't. I'm sorry. No. So, so we can leave that to the questions and answers. But okay, uh, as yeah. I said, this is uh, this is a lot to share in 20 minutes. 
Uh, hopefully, this has given you a flavor of what you're trying to do here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lutfi. And there are already some very interesting questions for you, including some from Bahia, I'm sure, that will, will postpone until uh, the intervention of our last speaker. I know uh, you went through many very important and, uh, uh, and, and critical ideas, especially coming from the university. So what we saw in these slides is a university. It's not a startup, it's not a science park. This is a university and that is extremely revolutionary in the region especially. So uh, for the discussion phase, I'm sure we will have relevant questions for you, Lutfi. Now, I don't wanna take uh, any more time, uh, but I'm very happy and honored to introduce Professor Helen Atkinson. She's a fellow at the Royal Academy of Engineering, and we're very grateful for the Academy being a co-organizer of this event. And she's uh, in Cranfield University as Pro Vice Chancellor of the School of Aerospace, Transport and Manufacturing. Uh, she took many leadership roles in the UK in the engineering ecosystem as the first woman president of the Engineering Professors Council, for example, and vice president and trustee of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Uh, Professor Helen will be giving us a case, will be giving us how things are working in the UK related to the topic of the discussion of this session. And I know I had a very interesting conversation with her yesterday that I can't wait for her to share the insights of what she will tell us right now. Helen, it's yours. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Morad. And uh, my great pleasure and, and honor to be on this call today and to be meeting people from across the region. So I'm going to share my screen uh, if I can find the right um, screen, if I can just find a way down hold on all the moment it's that green uh, button that says share screen at the bottom yes i've got share screen it's yes. okay i'm just finding the right presentation here we are okay okay So thank you very much. Uh, apologies, not so used to Zoom. Get <laughs> so, and so for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with the Royal Academy of Engineering, it is the National Academy for the UK, so the engineers equivalent of the Royal Society. So it is the most prestigious um, uh, institution for engineers in the UK. It's my great honour to be a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. And the Academy, it's a charity, it's a national academy, and it's also a fellowship bringing together the leading engineers from across the UK. So the topic which Professor Morad asked me to talk about was how the UK goes about actually measuring the process of research moving through to innovation and impact. And it's very interesting having heard the talks that Bahia has just given and Alotfi, uh, because what I'm going to say very much builds on what they've been talking about. So in the UK, the government uh, has what is called a research excellence frame framework. And ever since the 1980s, there has been a six yearly cycle where all the universities in the UK are required to actually submit uh, evidence about the quality of their research. And in the latest cycle, the latest assessment, uh, we had to actually submit every single academic who was research active. Now, one of the important things about that process is that it makes a very careful allowance for what we call special circumstances. 
so people who are on, for example, medical leave or maternity leave, so that we can ensure that it's fair and, and equal across people with many different circumstances, what we call the equality, diversity and inclusion um, agenda. I think the other really important thing to emphasize here is that it has to be within a very firm framework of academic quality and standards, because otherwise you get what I call perverse incentives. So a classic example of perverse incentives would be if you had a research excellence framework, which was only based on the number of published academic papers, because what then happens is that people publish papers uh, willy nilly uh, that aren't actually very good in at all. So in the UK, this measurement framework, the research excellence framework is based on the quality of papers. And that quality is based on a national team actually reviewing every single paper that is submitted to this process. So it's a great big assessment process. It also includes within the REF what's called environment, which is PhD students per academic, uh, the research income per academic, the amount of capital funding that a university has put into supporting research, what we call the research environment, the research strategy, and also the more general research experience for academics and for the PhD students. So is there a research culture in the university of people working together to support each other in their research endeavor and indeed working across the UK and internationally, globally to develop a very well-found uh, research culture and what we would call well-found laboratory and facilities. So you can have a brilliant academic, but if they haven't got the right research equipment, they can't be their best. Now, the third big pillar to this is what is called impact case studies. And I wanted to focus in on that because that is how we evidence research moving through to innovation. I'll, I'll skip over research in, um, outputs. So impact case studies. The first thing to say about impact case studies when we submit these into the research excellence framework, so every university has to submit them, and there are a, a number defined on the size of the university and the particular discipline. We're looking at a 20 year time scale. So you can have a piece of research that was done 20 years ago, which over 20 years is accruing impact. And I think that 20 year timescale is incredibly important because governments get very focused on much shorter timescales. Uh, politicians want to show that the money they put into uh, universities where there is public funding, they want it to be in a three, four, five year time period. But real research impact often takes 20 years or even longer than that to actually be achieved. So what is impact in this research excellence framework? It's not just about an invention or an innovation, as Latvia was saying, moving through to enable economic benefit. We use the term impact to mean societal benefit in its broadest sense. So it could be an impact on policy, could be an impact on health, it could be technological, it could be economic through the generation of new companies or growing companies or jobs or profit, um, but it could be legal. For example, in my previous institution, uh, one of the impact case studies was on how we had done work to improve the knowledge of stab wounds in murder cases so that when the law had to make a decision about whether someone was guilty or not, the law was making that decision with a much more uh, robust evidence base about whether when somebody said they fell on or the, the victim fell on a knife, whether the stab wound was actually 
indicative of falling on a knife or whether it had been done with a thrust uh, that was equivalent to, to deliberate intention. It could be a cultural benefit, it could be societal benefit, and it could be environmental benefit. So a whole series of ways of interpreting impact. So fundamentally, how do we get from research conducted in a university to an impact uh, on society? And why is impact important? In the UK, uh, one of the requirements for funding from our research council, so our public funding of research, is that we actually have to demonstrate in our bid for funding that we have a pathway to impact. We also need to be able to demonstrate that public money that is coming into research is being well spent. But that is again within this uh, 20 year time frame. So it's actually acknowledging that it can take a significant length of time for research to have an impact. It's a way of recognizing how um, how public funding is actually spent to, to get the right balance right across public funding for research. And it's important to emphasize that uh, in the UK, uh, as I think was a statement Professor Rad made earlier on, uh, it's not just about money coming from government into research, but there is in the UK a lot of funding from industry into research, much of it in conjunction with public funding. <laughs> And then we, we, we look at how we can actually evaluate so that we can improve the paths to impact for the future. So I only show this here. This is how we have to submit these case studies. I show this here because you'll see over on the right how tight the word count is. So we have an incredibly um, succinct case study process. But that case study, written case study, represents a huge amount of work on behalf of by, by the team involved to really establish an evidence trail. So a crucial part of this is the evidence trail. We have to be able to track back to a paper which could have been published 20 years ago, but then we need to be able to say, right, this policy change which has impacted on society can be traced back via these pieces of evidence to that bit of research. So that is quite a hard process because you'll realize people move it on over 20 years uh, that also you often get examples of impact where people know something, a piece of research has actually been important but it's difficult to identify a direct one-to-one -one correlation between that bit of research and creating 200 jobs or you know, a huge company like Arm, which actually came out of a, a piece of research in, in universities uh, originally. So, but it's a really tough evidential process of producing a case study. So we, we look for evidence, we look for corroborative evidence from uh, people and companies and bodies that can corroborate uh, the, the claims that are being made. Uh, we need to find what we call testimonial evidence from people who are credible witnesses. So it's almost a, it's like a semi-legal process. And, and the evidence can be all kinds. It could be users, it could be around sustainability, but it needs to be quantified again. It could be IP generation, going back to Bahia's uh, picture of things. And it could be uh, individual reports and, and other publications. So a whole range of evidence, but we try to help our academics to understand how to gather evidence along their impact journey. So just a few uh, short examples. I picked out uh, three that are related, in fact, to sustainability. Um, agricultural water management. 
This happens to be a UK based uh, case study, but it's the first national scale for the UK assessment of actual water demands in agriculture, alongside the financial benefits from using irrigation. So that the simulations and the models that have been developed have been used to evaluate farm scale strategies and then to actually feed that into the agriculture in the UK, including influences the government's uh, national water policy. Uh, another one is something called the publicly available specification, which sounds like a terribly abstruse sort of thing, but it's actually about through life engineering services for all kinds of huge engineering projects. So trains, planes, uh, huge chemical plants, assets like ships, where you look at the whole of their through life and then you say, how do we make our industrial base around those huge assets in terms of their whole life actually more productive and capable? And when we call it a publicly available specification, it's actually a British standard. So one that big companies like Rolls-Royce and BAE Systems actually use when they are uh, analyzing their own internal life cycle assessments. So this is very much in a framework of sustainability. Uh, we've looked at, at organizational safety and resilience and earlier on, uh, Adnan Badran was talking about all the global challenges at the moment. So there's a particular case study which Cranfield put together around how we've helped organizations to develop their resilience in a very challenging environment. And you'll see here some examples. One of them is from the Civil Aviation Authority for safety in air, airspace regulations. Uh, one is about policy building in the central banks for the Europe. Another one is actually helping organizations within the UK and internationally to actually develop their safety risk and resilience outcomes. And then more, more internationally for the water sector, actually looking at formalized risk management. And I know this will be important to many uh, Middle Eastern and North African countries, looking at risk management around water resources and helping the water supply companies to move to having a more developed understanding of where their risk is and how to manage that. So, you know, case study with international impact, which can be clearly demonstrated from many individuals testifying from many, many utility companies, 60 international utility companies. So across the UK, every university in this research excellence framework exercise has to submit these impact case studies. These are ones actually from engineering, at Cranfield, but uh, every subject area has to submit them. And I think in policy terms, and I know Professor Murad is very interested in how um, the, 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 the countries involved in this discussion today actually help to develop their own policy thinking. I wanted to just draw together in my final slide uh, what uh, I could draw out from this process in terms of impact and innovation. There are, there are some really important points here. But first of all, it is a national process. It involves every university, every subject area, and it is a process that we all have to and uh, are we're incentivized to be really invested in because our funding for research depends on the outcome from the research excellence framework. But that's only one component. Um, our reputation, our international reputation as universities depends on the outcomes from the research excellence framework. It's really important that it applies to all research academics. Uh, that's partly really important because it avoids people playing games. So when you have a selective um, methodology where only the best people are put in, people start hiding 
their less capable research academics. So by saying everyone has to be submitted, it's a very powerful process. I want to reinforce the 20 year time scale. It's much more powerful because it's 20 years rather than, for example, five years, which many governments might be um, uh, wanting to have. I think it's incredibly important that there's a rigorous auditable evidence framework around it. And I think it's incredibly important that it has to be within a framework of strong academic standards. So uh, for example, I mentioned earlier on that the number of PhD students completed per academic submitted is an important indicator. If you don't have strong academic standards around your PhD student quality for passing, then you end up in a system where uh, pe people just go for getting PhD students through independent of whether they actually measure up to what a PhD should be. So it's part of a wider ecosystem of strong academic standards. So I'll, I'll finish there, Professor Murad, and be very pleased to be involved in the discussion and the questions to come. Thank you very much, Professor Helen. Uh, this opened many, many windows for an appetite to talk about peer review, to talk about how do you assure quality and, and uh, and governance of innovation activities. You touched on many of these issues and about the multiplier and the 360 impact of uh, university research and universities, a lot more than uh, real estate development of a piece of land somewhere. But uh, all these issues are open. And I know there were many questions on the chat box that have been answered by Lutfi. Thank you, Lutfi, for being. Uh, in real time answering these questions. For now, I'm going to just ask colleagues who have any question to make it very brief, allowing uh, courtesy for others. And I'm going to start with Muhammad Al-Jafari. Please introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and direct question for whom? Muhammad. Very pleased to be here. My name is Mohammed Al Jafari. I am the director of the Intellectual Property Commercialization Office at the Royal Scientific Society. Uh, it's an advisory office that seeks to help uh, innovators and innovative institutions make the most out of their endeavors. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Atkinson, I, I appreciate the broader uh, definition of impact, and that that's what we try to. To achieve, but uh, I'd, I'd like to draw your attention to, to something that I noted while being at the offices of the USPTO in the United States. I think it was 2018 or 2019, one of those two years. So we visited there and it was a big loan program and we saw maybe seven or eight uh, public institutions, okay, publicly funded American institutions, including the biggest ones. So we were talking about the Institution of Health, the Department of Agriculture, NASA, and many others. And they were talking to us and they were telling us what they were doing to uh, fund innovation, to fund research, how they deal with their intellectual property, how they manage intellectual property. And uh, when the first one finished their talks, talks one, one of our colleagues, I think he was from India, he asked that department, he said, well, do you know how many jobs your funded research created? They said, no. He said, well, okay, how about economic activity? They said, well, we don't measure that. We know when we license out, we know when we get royalty, but we don't really know what the broader economic impact was. And then it became, became a game. So every public institution that shows up, we asked them, do you know what this actually does? And they said, well, no, we don't, but, but we're, we're part of a government program. We're funded out of a belief in the importance of funding this type of activity. And I think this component we're, we're kind of losing across the region whereby we, we become so impact oriented and I appreciate the 20 year time scale. it's fair. For us, maybe it's 20 months, maybe it's 20 days. And then somebody says, well, we funded you for this much. Well, what are you giving in return? There's, there's an important component that we're losing, which is, and this is what I want your, your opinion on, 
the fact that you are funding research because of a belief in the importance of this happening. You are funding the development of intellectual property because you believe in the importance of this happening. Sometimes you go after uh, impact, sometimes you register it, but this isn't the only reason that you're funding this. Thank you. Uh, Helen, can you pause your thoughts a little bit to collect if there are any other questions? If you have a question, please open your camera, raise your hand, let me know you have a question. I don't see any raised hand, but I think what Muhammad raised to Helen is very relevant. But Helen, please, we are in 2020 and we're not going to wait 20 years. There is something yes. called exponential technology. The rate of change and so the growth rate of is change is Please, huge. Uh, I totally let us, agree. Let with us keep you. faith that we will yeah. see impact in our lifetime. Yeah, so I totally agree with you. Of course, it doesn't have to be 20 years, it could be incredibly short. Uh, but some very profound research has led, you know, I think of, of uh, you know, many Nobel Prizes have led to great uh, economic impact, but it has taken time. Uh, but what the REF process does do is to quantify, yes, there is this wider definition of what impact is, uh, uh, but it does quantify jobs created and economic impact as a result of research in universities in the UK. So it does enable, the 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 the, um, the the governments who are funding and the bodies that are helping to enable that exploitation to actually evidence that what they're doing and the the result that it has. Okay, thank you. I uh, I'm gonna move to another topic. My uh, Dr. Majid Abu Zreg. I'm sorry if I miss miss misspelled your name go ahead you have your raised no that's that's right yeah that's right uh, so it was an excellent uh, presentation uh, i am majid abuzreg from jordan university of science and technology and uh, if we are going to tackle our you know uh, uh, talk in specific context about arab universities in particular now we are only competing in academic ranking using the ranking systems available over the world. And we all know that this is give us a sense of victory where actually no real impact is. Maybe we have, we have to move into another ranking system specifically designed for Arab universities that's actually concentrate on innovations and impact. Uh, this is the only way we can go forward. We have to admit that even so, I think Bahia and maybe Lotfi and others talk about universities. Now our universities, unfortunately, we are actually an institutions for issuing an educational certificates. We are not producing a lot in terms of innovations and impact in the society, and we have to edit it. The Chinese, 20 years ago, the Chinese start developing what we call the world ranking, world ranking university system, system a popular name, Shanghai system. And the idea was how university, how Chinese university in specifics are competing with other universities in the world. And they have done that. I, I don't know the results, how this ranking system has contributed to the developments in the Chinese economy within the past 20 years. But that system was created exactly in 19, I believe uh, it was in, 19, in, uh, two, in 2000. If I remember very well, 2000, even one or 2000 was, was fiercely, so that's exactly 22 years ago. And the Chinese was, during the last 22 years was really, uh, um, was really perfect. 
uh, I, I think we need to talk about, uh, I, I don't know if my comments make sense to, to people who work in innovations and um, okay. uh, inventions you. and innovation, right? Where I, I, I see they are going in the same path because some people are simply technical. They don't know what the society yes. is. Some <laughs> people, you. they are innovators. <laughs> Thank so, you, Professor yeah. Majid. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And, and the point is the, whether it's ranking the university or evaluating performance and promotion criteria for a professor or a researcher, it should be context related. It should be, it should be related to the national priority agenda and the context we are trying to serve, which is the local community and the socioeconomic challenges that, uh, that, that we have each in our own community. Before going to Lutfi, I have Bahia, her hand is up, and I hope you're not gonna be questioning Lutfi. Go ahead, Bahia. I will be, I will be. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lutfi, thank you so much for this. It's very much appreciated. And I agree with you in a part of what you said, which is not everything is patent or not everything is IP, and we have to work on innovation. Um, the way I would like to see it is more uh, balancing like it's not one or the other, but I wanted to ask you about, so you came to the conclusion where you want to focus on innovation because market cap is what's important and not necessarily IP or generating IP. Have you, um, within the national agenda of Qatar, is it um, like dependence or independence in terms of IP? Because Apple is dependent on licenses from Samsung and from IP generated by other companies. And uh, the time frame, like, are you limited with the time frame you want to make the impact? So is that why you chose to go this route now and then later change routes? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Bahia. And um, uh, it's an excellent question. The answer is, is really no. It's not about uh, limited time or, um, or eagerness to make a quick impact. Of course, there is that, but it, it's a lot more strategic than that. And it can, kind of addresses the question that uh, Dr. Majid made, is that we believe innovation has changed because times have changed. The definition of innovation itself has changed because times have changed. In the industrial revolution from the first to the third revolution, uh, following the book by Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nation, specialization was everything. Production was the name of the game in terms of invention. And technology and machineries and so on were there to make production more efficient, to make more of the same at a lower cost so that you can compete. That was also the basis for competition. Universities themselves organized themselves toward that concept of efficiency is that you train people to be specialized so that they are the best at doing that one thing, but they know very little about everything else. And this is to answer a question of Dr. Majid is that this is not about Arab universities. It's true for all universities around the world. Universities are still following the very old model of specialization. And that you mechanical engineer, all you know is mechanical engineer. You know nothing about markets. You know nothing about business needs. You know nothing about business models. If you're trained as a business model, you know nothing about technology, about rapid prototyping, about the impact of science. In the digital economy, the knowledge economy, the rules of the games have changed. It's not about specialization, it's about value creation. The complex challenges, whether climate change or, uh, or stock markets or whatever are very nonlinear, they're interconnected and they involve many disciplines from the humanities, from the politics, from, uh, from science and different technologies. And the solutions sit at the seams of those disciplines. So you cannot solve them with a traditional model of specialized people. And therefore, innovation now itself in terms of value creation. And here again to Professor Helen, when I talk about value creation, I'm not talking about economic value. I'm talking about sustainable value, political environment, societal, even policy making. So in the sense it merges with impact, but it's impact with novel thinking. This is the innovative part that comes into it. And so that's really, uh, uh, and so it is very strategic, it's very long-term. And it's this new approach to innovation is driven by the fact that we are in a new paradigm, which is the knowledge economy, 
which is not measured by the amount of assets or buildings or machines you have, but really about the ability to create a new knowledge or use existing knowledge to make a new impact. And so it changes the rules. And when you have different paradigm, you have to play by the new rules of that paradigm. And this is why companies like IBM are losing the race because they're still playing by the old rules. And universities that will insist on playing by the old rules will fail miserably, regardless of the number of IPs and patents and publications they're going to generate. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Luffy, some other people are asking about the, the slide to show the slide again, but all the slides will be shared through the organizers. All the presentations will be shared with the organizers. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to share any more slides at this time. I'm sorry, but I have Dr. Uh, Adnan Badran for intervention. That will be probably our last before we close it with uh, Dr. Abdullah and the Islamic World Academy of Sciences. Dr. Badran. Stop, stop, Dr. Dr. Adnan, stop, you Adnan. You're on mute. Mute, mute it. Yeah. I, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Uh, okay, thank you, Professor Murad. Uh, I think uh, really, if we take the Arab region, we are neglecting not to emphasize the education in the Arab region. Is the education promote innovation, promote thinking, critical thinking? Is our current education promote invention, promote uh, to seek for the truth and to seek to the unknown? You see, once very important that our education has followed what been the education in the past, memorization, uh, uh, teaching by uh, what I call uh, uh, forcing on the students not to think, but to repeat what the teacher says. So the teacher, I think, Plus the teaching profession is so important in the classroom, in the schools, from childhood, from the university, that we have to change to meet the challenges of knowledge economy, to be creative. If we are not creative, there is no innovation. If there, are, there is no basic science, there, are, there is no science to apply. So I think it's extremely important that we look into the education sector, how to reform our education from the KG to the primary school, to the secondary school, how to assess students, and then how to change the classroom to a smart classroom. Where the student, when they go to the school, they don't wanna leave it. Nowadays, the student goes to school and he keeps looking at his watch to leave the school. The school is not attractive anymore. Uh, it's, a, it's a classical school. And I think uh, the, uh, all what we call about research, invention, innovation, the most important is to change our human resources to rich human resources, like That's they've done much. in India. And yeah. this is why I, I wanna emphasize preparation of human resources with critical thinking, with the invention, with the, with, with, the, with the merits to analyze and to seek the truth is very important. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Badran, Your Excellency. This is, this is like, it cannot be concluded in better comments, better than what Dr. Badran from his very rich experience, research on the subject. Uh, and, uh, and, and I just wanna say concerning this comment that our professors, our teachers, our researchers in the universities cannot give what they miss. So they cannot, you know, they cannot train innovators and inventors and critical thinkers if they lack it themselves. And that's why I was very happy to see with Muhammad Al Jafari and Lutfi Bilkhair that they are training professors, teachers on these skills so that they could move it on, like train the trainers almost program. 
and it's extremely important. I'm gonna stop at this time and uh, thank Bahia, Lutfi, and Helen for being such wonderful panelists with me. I hope we delivered uh, some new ideas, some uh, path for uh, colleagues on this meeting to explore further beyond the session that was only an appetizer, I believe. From uh, my side, I'm gonna pass on the baton to Dr. Abdullah, leading the Islamic World Academy of Sciences. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, Fouad, Lutfi, Bahia, and Helen, for the exciting and really very fruitful uh, talk, which excited a lot of uh, fruitful discussion as well from the audience. And I would like uh, to thank also all uh, those who spare their time and come and participate in this session. As a matter of fact, we are encouraged uh, to meditate upon holding another session about entrepreneurship. Hopefully, we will see you again once more. Thank you very much. And we would like to sign off. Thank you. Thank you very much.